Thank you for coming. Uh, can you hear me clearly up there? Looks like it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, virtualization and in, in embedded. Um, there'll be a bit about, well, quite a bit about Xen as well, but I'm going to look at other open source hypervisors as well. But you know, first, actually, we have to ask ourselves, why do you want to embed virtualized uh, virtual systems? And to a large degree, it's actually uh, quite similar to you know, server virtualization. It's on, on, on to one degree about consolidation, um, which primarily is about cost, size, weight, and interestingly, in some cases, also about heat and so on as well in, in an embedded context too. Uh, I think there's a few examples, for example, like in some car environments, you know, like when you have the little camera which helps you park and stuff like that. Um, and that can, can, can cause some problems in some areas with heat because you have a you know, few CPUs on very, in, ve in very close proximity which has to be somewhere in a car. So there's additional um, aspects to this whole thing as well. Another interesting thing which is particularly interesting in the embedded context is also about, to some degree, reducing the development cost, i.e. being able to port legacy applications or something uh, you know, which you've written to a different environment without having to do all the base porting work because you're working towards in a, in a virtual environment. It's also around security and safety um, uh, can be big concerns in, uh, in that space. Um, so one thing which you typically want to do in an embedded environment is to support, uh, this is called mixed criti criticality compositions, which means you want to be able to run applications in different containers, uh, if you want so, um, with different safety, security, and real-time requirements. Um, and you know, one of the key things in some markets is you have to have a safety-certified hypervisor if you use a hypervisor technology for isolation. And then you have a whole set of additional embedded requirements, you know, such as low interrupt latency, lower zero scheduling overhead, um, particularly if you do something with rich I.O., um, which is quite often the case for, um, say, automotive applications, you need to have a lot of drivers for specialized I.O., you know, touch screens, all these kind of things which you normally have on a phone. And to support all this, you need to have a fairly flexible architecture um, to build you know, vi widely varying systems, if you want so. Uh, so let's just really do a quick reminder of hypervisor architectures. I'm going to focus on ARM only because um, that's sort of the main player in this space. Um, so if you look at ARM privilege layer uh, uh, levels, you have EL0, which is user mode, EL1, kernel mode, and then you have that EL2 space, which is um, where a hypervisor would run in. And then underneath, you would have something like trust zone, as well, and there's some interactions you know, between trust zones and hypervisors too, but I'm, that's going to get a little bit complicated, so I'm not going to go into this. So how does a hypervisor, how, how would they typically map into this model? So your classical type one would run in uh, EL2. Um, you would have your drivers run as part of the device, uh, uh, the hypervisor, then you have all your virtual machines sitting on top of it. Then you have this uh, type two kind of model where you have Fundamentally, the host kernel and the hypervisor kind of run uh, together. You know, like if you look at KVM, the hypervisor is kind of KVM IO kernel model module. Then you do have this whole user space, you know, box which comes with the host, and then you have your, you know, VMs there. And what's interesting, if you look at it from a control plane perspective, in the model on the right, you kind of can just use the user space of the host for control. Whereas, you know, typically what you would do in a model on the left is you either have some kind of interface where you externally control the, the whole system or you have some bit of code you know, as a module in there or you use one dedicated VM to do that. So let's just look at a few examples of, open, of, of, of hypervisors today in that space. Um, so this one which is kind of really interesting is called L4E. It kind of comes from a um, uh, wide heritage of uh, hypervisors, there's a whole family called the L4 family, kind of originally were developed um, in the whole, for the whole mobile space. Um, 
Um, this one keeps on coming up in discussions about automotive. Um, it's written specifically for mixed criticality compositions, a typical microkernel design. Um, in a kernel space, really, they just do address brace, implementation threats, and IPC kind of functionality. Everything else is in user space. Um, it's got a solid feature set. Um, I think it is a little bit weak on hardware support. It's also kind of arguably arguable, particularly at this audience at Fostem, when it's really open source. You know, they um, uh, it is G GPL, but it's got a dual license, and you have to sign, you know, do copyright assignment and all those kind of stuff if you want to contribute. Also, there seems to be no real community around it. Um, but you know, this could go somewhere. Um, Another one which occasionally comes up here is Jailhouse. Um, it's relatively lightweight, less than 10,000 lines, uh, lines of code. It's a partitioning hypervisor. It comes from Siemens. Um, Community-wise, um, relatively small. I think 80% of all the code seems to come from one developer. Um, uh, they use Linux to kind of bootstrap the system, and then after the bootstrap, it's kind of, you know, still partly used for control plane. The focus there is really on partitioning, but not so much on virtualization. So they don't have things like scheduler, you know, IO emulator and stuff like that. It seems to have a really good basic feature set, um, but there's some areas which are, you know, still under development. I think particularly because we're talking about um, um, ARM virtualization here, you know, the, 60, the ARM 64-bit support is fairly new. Um, there's also a really interesting talk from the AGR, which was given uh, earlier this year, which you can get to. Um, the previous slide has a, has a similar, more in-depth um, uh, uh, discussion here. Um, then we have Xen, um, uh, fairly you know, general-purpose hypervisor. Most people know it from, from cloud computing and basic server virtualization, but as we will show, it's actually used in a lot of other market segments today too. Um, again, you know, we have Linux and NetBSD to bootstrap. Um, and it's got quite an expensive feature set. It's highly customizable, and we have a fairly strong and diverse open source community around it. Um, and the following picture kind of gives you a sense of this. Um, well, this just shows, you know, like different vendors having built products and services around it. If you look at the top right, that's sort of traditional server vert. Then we have kind of cloud computing. Then the top left bottom, that's kind of security-focused products. Um, uh, and we we'll kind of go a little bit into this because security is a big aspect of the whole um, uh, um, embedded story as well. And then we do have quite a few. Um, embedded product, uh, uh, products as well. And actually, I started working with Xen around 2011, and really what happened is that whole security segment started to pick up around that time, and it's grown since. There's been a push which doubled the number of, of players pretty much in the last two or three years, which was around that time when all this embedded stuff just started happening. Uh, we didn't plan for it, it just happened, uh, you know, basically because there seems to be a good match for it. So let's draw this back on, we talked about hypervisor architectures before. Let's bring this back to what is actually Xen, because you know, it's kind of a type one, but it's kind of not a traditional architecture. So um, one of the differences between um, your traditional type one, and Xen is that the device drivers don't run in EL2 and not in a hypervisor. We basically reuse the drivers from um, DOM0, and then basically because we have the specialized you know, DOM0 virtual machine, that's then also our control plane. Um, there's strong isolation, so for example, the drivers are running in EL1. As I said, in the L4Re, they're running in user space, so that's obviously a little better. And then we have these uh, grand tables, which kind of provide additional isolation between different VMs. From a control plane perspective, you know, in the ser on, 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 on a server system, you know, the sysadmin will basically, you know, use DOM0 or some graphical tool, you know, which connects to it to control your system. In embedded, you need a lot less. Um, uh, 
it's really you know primarily used the control plane for config and setup, and then basically primarily for system health monitoring, you know, applying possibly software updates and uh, those kind of things. So you need, a, you need much less functionality there. So, you're, you know, having a big distro running in DOM0 isn't really uh, necessary. So what people in the space tend to do now today is just lose a, use a basic Linux kernel with a root file system or something like that. But this could be made smaller uh, and there's some, some work going on in this area. And that shows you that control plane. So let's talk about some. So we talked about some of the specific requirements in embedded. Um, and, and one of them was around PV drivers, which is IO and so on and so forth. So there's been quite a lot of momentum in our community for a while. So we have all the standard stuff around disk and so on that's been around forever. There's also some GPU sharing. It's not traditionally a PV protocol in the way how it kind of works. It's, uh, it's a slightly different model, but it has the same kind of effect. Um, there's also work going on, and this is being driven by some automotive vendors around uh, general coprocessor sharing, so that taking some of the ideas we used for GPU sharing and extending them to FPGAs and you know anything which might kind of look like a coprocessor because it's the same kind of principle. Um, some prototypes around there right now that have made some design changes recently and we'll probably have a, a fully baked framework come, come this year. Um, then there's been quite a few new ones. Uh, there's a 9P, 9PFS PV cores that's sort of forward, a POSIX forward, a call forwarding where you have your, you know, your POSIX API in one VM, and then you basically just have a shim, and it routes calls through. It's actually quite interesting. There's been benchmarks as well, and there's things like multi-touch, sound display, DRM. And what's really interesting, and I find this a lot, so a lot of the embedded uh, companies, they just tend to, embedded companies, they just take stuff, they hack it, and then they push it out. Um, and so we found that a lot of them you know, are, drive, uh, are writing their own drivers um, and a, a couple of them, I managed to get them to upstream it and standardize, um, which is kind of good, but it's relatively easy to, drive, to write those drivers, particularly if you don't care about standardizing the ABI, which you can do if you, you know, do this for your, for your own product. So let's look at some security properties um, of Xen. You know, security is kind of important. Um, so, apart from the typical hypervisor functionality, you have functionality which, which enables you to do further system partitioning. So, you know, we already touched on this. You can basically disaggregate your system in sense, or you can write, have run device drivers, you know, in a specific, specific VM. You know, network drivers are typically a main route of attack for a system. Um, and you can do this for other drivers as well. You can put other system components into separate VMs as well and then kind of plumb it all up um, to make a distributed system. There's also the capability of controlling um, the capabilities of a specific VM with the equivalent, with the extent of equivalent of SE Linux. And that kind of enables you to build a multi-layered security approach and that's actually being used in some of those products um, which um, uh, some of the security products which started appearing a few years ago. There's other security features like trusted execution environment and stuff like that, virtual machine introspection, ultra PM life patching, all this kind of stuff, but that, it's not quite clear whether that's interesting for that um, uh, um, for that whole embedded, embedded segment. I mean, I could imagine that virtual machine introspection could be something interesting for health monitoring of a system, but it's, it's not quite clear how this would fit in. As we're talking about security, I think we do also have to talk about Meltdown and Spectre quite quickly. I don't know whether we had lots of talks about this yet today, but uh, um, obviously Meltdown is the most dramatic one. Um, uh, um, from a Xen perspective, it can't really be exploited uh, in fully virtualized VMs. 
So pro fundamentally, on ARM, um, we don't use um, software virtualization. We just use hardware extensions. So from that viewpoint, we're actually fine. And you know, on x86 with HVM and PVH, that's true as well. We do have mitigations, but you know, I think for that embedded and automotive use case, we don't have to deal with the performance overhead some of those fixes will give us. Spectre is a lot more interesting. Um, uh, um, we started going through the code base at this stage manually. Hopefully at some point, tools like Coverity and stuff will help us find some of the uh, kind of gadgets and code patterns which, um, uh, which could be used to exploit those vulnerabilities. Um, but it's a lot harder to kind of go down this route in a xen based system because, you know, um, uh, to, to exploit Spectre, you need something called a gadget. So in a Linux kernel, there's this uh, eBPF engine, um, uh, which was, you know, by Google Project Zero used to, on KVM to demonstrate how you get information out. We have gone through the code and, uh, I mean, not line by line, but through the architecture, and we don't think there's anything similar to that in the code base, but you know, at the end of the day, we won't really be sure unless there's really tools which allow us to verify that. So hopefully that should be fine. So let's look at one of the other techniques. Um, so this is whole sandboxing, this aggregation thing, uh, where you can run um, uh, um, drivers in different VMs. So how does this work? Well, um, you have a regular, you know, your DOM zero on the right, a regular application running in a VM, and then, you know, we have this thing called a storage domain, which would have a disk driver in it, or a network domain, which has a network driver in it. And then basically, um, uh, um, DOM zero kind of connects the to topology, and, you know, your, your application will talk to, to the back end, which will talk, uh, talk to the front end, which will talk to the back end in a, in, in a storage domain, which will talk to the real disk driver, and I would then talk to the controller, and the same can be done for a network, and fundamentally, the same can be done for any I.O. pretty much. Um, <clears throat> then there's this thing called XSM or Flask, which is like a sense variant of SE Linux. Um, so here you have your VM, um, you can write a policy, um, which controls you know, what you can do with various interfaces. So you would typically you know, define some classes of VMs and then assign those uh, classes to specific um, workloads in VMs when they come up. That gives extra protection because then you can only do certain things, uh, certain operations from within this uh, uh, um, VM. Everything else gets blocked. It's disabled by default, so you, have, you do have to enable it by kconfig. Um, uh, uh, and it's very similar to the Linux security modules. It uses the same policy syntax. You can use all the same tools. It's just different new objects which are um, used on top of it. And fundamentally, um, the guys who do that use XSM together with SE Linux in their systems. If you want to know more, there's a little bit of documentation. Uh, the slides will be online um, via the Fosbin site and also you know, on my SlideShare channel. So, that's some of the term terminology around security. So, I kind of want to look a little bit into um, how this actually works. Um, so, we have a number of security-based products in Xen. So, there's KubesOS. KubesOS, they have a booth here at Fostem. Go find them if you're interested. There's OpenXT, which is in some sense similar to KubesOS. It's just an open source project which allows you to build KubesOS type of applications. And then there's a product called Crucible Defense from a company called Starlab. And they, they're, they're, they're targeting military type applications. It's kind of certified product and so on and so forth. So I wanted to briefly show how some of the stuff works in practice. So uh, KubesOS, Edward Snowden likes it, <laughs> um, uh, um, which you know is probably a good thing. Uh, and how does this work? So you have your typical Fedora UI here. On the top right, you see kind of all the VMs are running. And then on the left, you kind of, it's, it's like an application starter, like on Windows, where you can basically define which application runs in which VM. 
under the behind the hood, you have Xen, the DOM zero kind of do, does all this UI stuff. There's a network domain. They have a firewall VM which controls all the firewall policies. There's something called a USB service domain when you put a USB device in that gets started in a VM, and then you have you know, those defined uh, different VMs where you run different applications in. And if, for example, you then start, you know, um, uh, uh, an application, then, you know, like your network traffic would be routed to those VMs, and then your USB traffic would be routed through that. So you kind of get this extra isolation, which makes it harder for exploits uh, to, to infect your entire system because you have all these little sandboxes in place. And they're going down some interesting routes of having, being able to host some of this in clouds as well, well, uh, as well. So go talk to them if you're interested in this. So embedded in automotive. Um, one of the interesting things is being able to partition the system. So in Xen, we have a lot of different schedulers with different properties. And you can assign these schedulers to you know, different groups of, you know, uh, CPUs on the system. This shows, there's like a, we have an average scheduler, there's a hard real-time standard, there's a soft real-time scheduler, we have a regular VM scheduler, and then there's the capability to pin um, virtual machines to CPUs um, without overhead um, using the entire management stack. So that kind of doesn't give you a lot, you know, it does give you still those virtualization boundaries, uh, and all the tools, but you know, uh, it's a very attractive proposition. Here's the same thing again in terms of overviews. I'm not going to go through this uh, in a lot of detail. Have a look at this later on um, if you're interested, or talk to me afterwards. Another interesting uh, property. This is around interrupt latency. So we have this uh, concept that interrupts. Uh, where physical always follow in physical inter uh, follow vir virtual interrupts. So when an interrupt gets injected, um, it's always injected on a CPU, um, which is running a virtual CPU. If um, for whatever reason that is moved by the scheduler, then you know at one point that gets routed back to the other virtual CPU, and the next time around, it comes in you know um, the normal way. And what's interesting is that actually that whole approach really gives you um, fa fairly low um, uh, uh, um, interrupt latency. So this was around 2,000 nanoseconds with the null, null scheduler. Um, uh, um, and that's the sort of maximum um, over a specific run. And there's a whole blog post about that too. I think one of the things we do need to talk about, particularly if you talk about automotive, is safety certification, because that's a big, difficult issue in open source. Um, so there's several levels to this. So one is around code quality. So typically, you would have to run special static analysis tools, which are quite expensive, which, you know, where, where um, uh, you have to comply to the cert MISRA coding standards. Um, we've been running a project with a was a tools vendor who's been doing this for us for free, and we're starting to work through all the issues. So that's kind of a good first step. Uh, another thing around safety certification is uh, you have to prepare a lot of artifacts all the way through the development process from you know, requirements all the way how it gets implemented in the code. Um, this is kind of tough in an open source project um, because it's a lot about reverse engineering. Um, we have had two companies who have done this. Um, so we know it's doable. So it's, at the end of the day, it's just a cost thing. Um, <clears throat> but then, then those guys, of course, have a commercial project, and they pass it on you know, to uh, uh, they pass the cost on to their, to, to their customers. Um, and you kind of lose some of the sharing stuff around open source. Uh, development process is Sony. Um, open source development process does not comply with safety standards. Um, there is a way to do that, but that means backfitting a lot of stuff, so that's quite expensive. Um, that brings us then to the potential about, you know, how could you do this better in open source? So one idea is that you could have some sort of official, you know, code line or, sort of, you know, project supported code line somewhere, and that you get the interested parties to kind of do, you know, maybe create a consortium or, so, you know, some sort of structure 
to do this together and share some of the cost. Um, there's a lot of discussion around this going on for various projects and so on in Linaro, in, uh, in the AGL, you know, Automotive Great Linux and so on. The biggest thing so is you need to have somebody to blame if something goes wrong. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's one of the main purposes of certification, really. Um, so, so this is interesting, this is evolving. I don't know whether open source can play a role in there, but we're gonna try. So let's just look at some examples of vendors who are using Zen and Embedded as well as an automotive, and a quick demo and then close. So one of the vendors we have uh, is Dernerworks. Um, they started out as a small consulting uh, company in the US. They're now maintaining three Xen distros. They used to have different names, but they've kind of rebranded them now together. It's called, there's like Virtuosity. There's Virtuosity for NXP and for Xilinx. Um, their core Virtuosity product is actually certified, safety certified to various different standards. Uh, it's quite a long list down there. Um, there is a company called Starlab. They're also going through that whole certification uh, a, pr a process right now, and then we have a few, you know, that means that we actually know this stuff can be certified, right? It's doable at some reasonable cost. Those companies aren't huge, so you can do it. And then there's a number of others um, who play in that space too. Automotive, it gets even more interesting. So there is a, a company called Globe Logic, they're tier two automotive OEM. They have a product based on Xen, um, uh, done some contributions um, over the years. Um, right now they're very focused on bringing some of this stuff to market. They have a competitor called EPAM. Uh, it's quite similar what they're doing. I like EPAM more because they're a lot more actively engaged in the community. Um, and they have some interesting features where they look at the sort of cloud automotive interface. I'm gonna show you a demo quickly. And then uh, we know that L LG Electronics, Bosch, and a couple of others are playing with this whole stuff too. So demo, so those who are not gonna be there, who are not here, they can see that demo by going to the link. And I'm just gonna try and play this now and see what happens. The internet of transportation is becoming a reality and soon individual vehicles will become a part of this internet. Vehicles need to keep up with the latest safety standards and regulations, but combining internet-enabled software with mission-critical functions on the same platform creates quite a challenge for the industry. EPAM's Cloud Fusion platform is a unique solution that solves this challenge. It includes hardware isolation enabled by virtualization, rapid services deployment using containers, and end-to-end -end security for full cloud integration. With the EPAM Cloud Fusion platform, traditional in-car software stacks run on independent hardware using a special virtual machine dedicated to cloud-managed, dynamically deployed services. The instrument cluster, running a custom Linux instance, implements some basic vehicle functions. In-vehicle infotainment, based on HEL IVI, provides user applications and media features. The Fusion Virtual Machine is sandboxed from hardware and can interact with the rest of the system using an OEM-managed set of restricted APIs. Each cloud service is deployed to the virtual machine in a container. Deployed services cannot interfere with other processes. In this demo, the cloud service collects telematics data from the vehicle. Using a micro service-based architecture, part of the cloud application is deployed inside of the Fusion container. Importantly, deployment of the app does not require any prior integration with the car OEM or Tier 1. To demonstrate the simplicity of the deployment, we'll enable some new features in the cloud application. Fuel consumption, engine RPM, and gear settings. In this scenario, only some of the desired features are available from the in-car applications. Via a web application interface, the vehicle part of the application is updated separately and new in-vehicle functions are enabled. Notice that the rest of the system operation is not interrupted during the service update. Even if the update fails or crashes or is otherwise unable to run, operation of the critical system is not affected due to the isolation of the Fusion Virtual Machine. After the vehicle service finishes updating, we see that new functions have been enabled in the vehicle 
Fusion is based on open source software technologies. With Fusion, new automotive... Okay, that's enough. <laughs> anyway, so, so you get the idea, and it's actually a really interesting use case. Um, so looking at this diagram, that was the diagram we kind of saw earlier, but you know, what's interesting again is that they're actually using some of these driver, you know, rather than having specific drivers in separate virtual machines, they kind of split them up, they have the drivers for one application, you know, in a different VM and they're sort of cutting some corners there, but it's basically the same concept. Um, so. Just to summarize, um, uh, you know, why is Xen really interesting in this space? Um, you know, as, as I said earlier, we're not really pushing this, haven't really starting to push this very hard um, because at the end of the day, this just happened. Um, but you know, after really two years of watching this, you know, there's really something there which is worth building on. So you know, it's quite a flexible platform. <laughs> used in a lot of different market environments. It's apparently relatively easy to port to new environments, otherwise you wouldn't see an explosion of so many different products. It's highly customizable, and part of that is also relatively easy to develop new drivers. Um, there's quite a lot of security and resilience functionality there. Obviously, if we ever want automotive to become interesting, we're going to have to deal with the functional safety aspect. Um, we're kind of looking at ways now how this could potentially be done. It's, it's going to be a hard nut to crack. It's not going to be quick, but you know, everybody, a lot of other projects are currently looking at the same thing. You know, a, a Linux has to solve this somehow um, for automotive grade Linux. There's a lot of other projects which have to kind of help solve this, and we're starting to work together. There's a couple of challenges, really, which we're looking at. So we have a lot of different I.O. drivers, some of them not open source. So we've been working with some of the vendors to standardize on some of the protocols. The same is happening around GPU virtualization. We're looking at um, maybe a more minimal DOM, DOM zero. You know, like maybe we can use some sort of RTOS for that. That would be interesting. And testing has been a surprising challenge for Embedded as well. Um, so again, there we've been working, for example, we've been working with Renesas now to get some of the uh, our, uh, our gen boards um, into a server chassis <laughs> um, with some management functions such that we can actually deal with this in the same way as with other hardware. And hopefully, some of the hardware specs for that will go open source, and then we can do the same for some other similar kind of you know, boards in the similar form factors. And that's really it uh, for me today. Um, if you have questions, we do have some time, do we? Yeah. I'm, uh, you, you stressed me. I could have talked for a little bit longer. Never mind. There was a question up there. Was it you? Ah. <laughs> well, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, like, um, I, I, I'm not telling you, you have, oh. So the question was, when, when to not use Xen? Um, I, I think it, Ultimately, it depends on your use case and preferences, right? So if you look at Xen today, um, um, it's, a lot more, it's a lot more complicated in many ways um, uh, than, for example, KVM. That's, we've been hurting from that a little bit in the traditional server uh, virtualization space because KVM is a lot easier to use. Um, uh, um, so I think, you know, really, if you look at, if you want to have uh, simplicity, and kind of may maybe more ease of use, and maybe there's better competitors. If you're looking at some more complex stuff where you want to plunge things together, and you want to, you're, you're actually okay with taking the overhead of the extra complexity, then that's probably for you, right? I do have a question. What about Intel support? I mean, uh, do you see Intel embedded is not so strong, but maybe in the industrial area is so, uh, Okay, so the question was around Intel support, um, and 
you know, particularly maybe in some industrial areas, in, 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 in industrial, and I guess you're, 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 there's a lot of these, how do I call it, the plug computers, kind of this Intel uh, in, in use. So there is, there is some momentum there. Um, I have one, two startups who are working on a product in this space and are probably going to use Intel architecture first to push into that market. It's probably going to be a container element in it as well. Um, it is a lot more challenging from, a, um, a, from a, I think, anything which will require safety certification. It's a no-go area, for, at least for Xen, um, because you know, the code base is a lot bigger. The, the ARM port is around, depending on how much you use or not, between 20 or 30,000 lines of code. The x86 stuff is a lot more. <laughs> Uh, and quite often you need to use QMU as well, right? So that's, that's obviously a barrier, but I think, I think in some market ma segments um, it's, it's definitely a possibility. So you're saying uh, those companies who succeeded in safety certification, they did it for art? Uh, so the question was, um, the companies who did the safety certification for RAM, for, 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 uh, and, and did they succeed? Well, but who succeeded? They did it for. Actually, I think so. Uh, um, Derner Works, I believe, did it both for ARM and x86. But the x86 configuration would have to be very cut down and constrained, right? Because otherwise, it would be too cost cost intensive. And particularly in that, you know, today we have like PV, PV. You have to forget, right? Uh, um, uh, um, I think it might become, you know, HVM, then you have to deal with the QMU aspect. I don't know, you know, how you deal with this. You will probably have to use a QMU and pretty much take everything out which Xen doesn't need. It's actually a lot. There's only very little Xen actually needs. But then you have to maintain that fork, right? Um, maybe PVH is actually, when this comes more widely used, that's sort of probably the interesting route to, to, to take. Yeah. Yeah, so power management is a really interesting challenge in this space right now. So this is something out. Oh. So the question was if you have drivers in different VMs, um, uh, um, there are you know, properties like, you know, power management which could cause problems and you need to kind of address this. So, um, in fact, there's a really interesting story around this. So, you know, I met, met some of the exciting guys who have their, you know, distro, that's what, they, which have a Xen-based distro. Um, actually, we, st we talked to them, I think in 2015, I, they invited me to an event, wanted, requested a meeting, asked a lot of questions about Xen, Two years later, I didn't hear anything. They launched a product, <laughs> um, and it was apparently quite successful. You know, a lot. You know, uh, a lot of their users use it. But one of the things they have come across is exactly this whole issue with power management and stuff like that. But not only in the context of um, uh, not only in the context of you know disaggregating drivers, but also higher up when you look at workloads. So on a driver side, you could, you know, you could, fo you could you know, focus on a number of operating systems which you allow, and you can plumb some functionality in there such that that kind of gets coordinated. But, you know, like, what happens even further up the stack, right? If you have, so if I look at this Xfinings um, uh, Xen-based product, they allow, they allow you to have, they have, a, they have something called bare metal VMs, which are almost like traditional ROM images with a support library and you just can bang, you know, one of these old images into a VM and they offer that and lots of people use it. Um, and then they have support for different artists as well. But then you start, unless you have all the power management and all the sort of heterogeneous kind of coordination, it's not just about power management, other properties as well, then you're going to start to get into trouble. Um, and I see some momentum building in this area to start resolving some of these problems. We're out of time apparently, so... Uh, uh, ah.
All right, and then my colleague here will follow up afterwards. So find me afterwards or at the Xen booth if you have questions.